Good evening. Uh, welcome to our ICD Section 15 webinar. And uh, we welcome tonight uh, our uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Rostan Zain. And also tonight, our, is our president Good uh, evening. of Section uh, welcome 15. Welcome to our ICD Section 15 webinar. Welcome to the webinar. Okay, and uh, tonight, um, we will have a very um, eminent speakers. By the way, uh, since it's just past uh, Chinese New Year's Day around last week, so we wish all our members who are celebrating Chinese New Year, happy Chinese New Year, may be the year of Tiger, be a prosperous year um, for all of us. Okay, now uh, let me, uh, uh, before we start, let me introduce uh, the speaker, uh, <coughs> about the speaker, it's about something about the speaker. Okay, uh, the speaker is currently Professor Dr. Rosna Zin. She is currently the Dean of Faculty of Dentistry at Massa University. And he, she's also the Honorary Professor at the University of Malaya from 2018. And uh, Professor Rosna is also the adjunct professor at the University of Ailanga, Surabaya, Indonesia from 2018 to 2021. Uh, professor Rosna Zain is also the Professor of Oral Pathology and Oral Medicine at the University of Malaya for more than 35 years, with more than 15 years as an administrator, including as a Dean of the Faculty of Dentistry from 2010 to 2014. Uh, professor Rosna is also the Founding Director of Oral Cancer Research and Quarantine Center at the University of Malaya, OCRCC, where she has led OCRCC from 2005 to 2015 in ensuring the standardization of lesions criteria, methodology, quality of control of research for research and oral cancer and develop a training module for our oral, can oral cancer uh, lesions detections. Currently, she is also the advisor to OCRCC uh, from 2016. And she is also the immediate past president of Association of Oral Facial Disease, MAOFD. Professor Rosna is also the immediate uh, past president of the Asian Society for Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, or ASMOP. Okay, without further ado, I will invite Professor Rosna uh, to share her experience with us on the topic oral cancer and related conditions, understanding risk factor terminologies and competency requirements of the dental undergraduate program. Professor Rosna, uh, the screen is yours. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Mamat. Um, and thank you to Datuk Dr. Hao and Professor Mamat for the invitation uh, for me to give this lecture. And um, I think without anything else, I'll just start the lecture right now, okay? Sorry. Um, okay, so um, the title that I've chosen is All Cancer and Related Conditions. And there are so many things to talk about oral cancer related conditions. Uh, but my main concern is all about oral cancer control. Therefore, I've chosen two aspects which do, do have um, bearing to oral cancer control. And one aspect is about risk factor. And I think many of you all actually um, have learned and there's so many updated publication on risk factors. Uh, but what I'm touching is something about respect the terminologies, which uh, can be misunderstood. Um, it was misunderstood before, and it, uh, now after looking through a number of papers and things like that, uh, there, um, there may be more room for improvement in uh, getting, uh, understanding these uh, terminologies. And then related to that, when we talk about oral cancer control, we would like to have more uh, dentists who are able to or competent to diagnose um, oral cancer. 
Uh, and when you say diagnose oral cancer, it actually means being able to differentiate oral cancer, uh, which are especially oral cancer, which are early lesions, uh, from the oral potentially malignant disorders from the benign lesions. Uh, here, I'm talking more about, I will be talking more about competency of the dental undergraduates, but it actually means that it is the competency of new dentists because if you get the dental undergraduate to be competent at the end of the program, it means the new dentist will be competent. So um, just as an introduction, I'll start off with uh, global epidemiology. Uh, oral cancer is ranked at 18, most common cancer worldwide, and it is now about 377,713. The incidence is high in males, as compared to females with six uh, per 100,000 and female at 2.3. And similarly, mortality was also higher for males than female. Uh, when we look at this map, I think we, we can see that um, the dark blue is where the uh, age standardized rate is the highest and that uh, the areas are Australia, India, at the Southeast Asia, and then the uh, Europe and Russia and North America. And then, uh, then you have less uh, incidence uh, at, in some other countries. And uh, if we look at Southeast Asia, I think we are talking, you know, as an overall, Asia has the most which is about 65% followed by Europe. And then there is um, North America, okay? So uh, if you look at Asia, Southeast Asia is here. It's, uh, it is not, it is I think number, about number 12. And the highest would be um, Papua New Guinea, uh, with uh, South Central Asia and Eastern Europe and Australia and New Zealand. Now, uh, if we looked at it closely, the, uh, this is again the only the Southeast and Southeastern Asia hub. Um, since I'm from Malaysia, I tend to sort of put it as Malaysia, which uh, shows, um, I think about uh, number four, number um, 12, okay, sorry, number 14 here. Uh, but the highest is actually Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, and followed by these other countries. But what I'm trying to show you is that in the next slide is actually the mortality. And in terms of mortality, um, Malaysia is um, has moved up in terms of mortality. That means it's high, uh, it's uh, compared to other countries, it's higher, but the mortality rate is still highest uh, in, pa in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, and Sri Lanka. Uh, the thing that I wanted to stress here, which I, I'm not showing here, uh, Australia, uh, but if you really looked at the map uh, and the, uh, as earlier, you have seen that the incidence in Australia is high. However, when you talk about mortality, the mortality in Australia is a lot lower than uh, some other countries. So um, that um, possibly reflects the health system or uh, something or something to that effect. Okay? So uh, anyway, it, the oral cancer is actually a battle. So in doing this, we must, we must uh, go towards early detection to reduce the burden of cancer. And the next slide, just to show that uh, a projection of 2020 to 2040 shows that it's on the increase, then this is just an example for Malaysia. And I'm, I'm sure it is almost similar to the other, uh, with many other countries. And similarly, the mortality is increasing with um, the higher, as we said earlier, it's in males. And here is just the estimated death. Um, the, the first one, sorry, the, the title's up here. Estimated um, incidence 
is going to be a 90.4% increase by 2040. And the estimated death will be 108.4% increase. So it is a real burden. We have to do something about it. So uh, when we talk about cancer control, this is an effort to reduce the incidence and mortality of cancer and to enhance the quality of life of those affected by cancer through an integrated and coordinated approach directed to primary prevention, early detection, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliation. There are three strategies for cancer control, primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. I'm only going to talk about primary prevention and secondary prevention because primary prevention would relate to an introduction to a risk factor that I'm going to talk about, and secondary pre pre prevention would relate to the competency uh, of um, graduates, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, in this lecture. So let's start off with our cancer control strategy, primary prevention. It aims to intervene before diseases occur. And it's the most effective long-term strategy for cancer control. So the strategies for primary prevention would be to raise awareness of the public. Therefore, uh, there is a requirement that the public knows about risk factors. So that uh, is where the dentists play a big role in uh, informing um, the public. Uh, I mean, as they come to your clinic, uh, that will be the best uh, area to inform the public. Then the second one is the um, effort and support towards modification of risky behaviors and uptake of healthy lifestyle. So here, I think when you talk about smoking, there's a lot of programs uh, for smoking cessation. But in general, uh, with uh, all the risk factor, we have to move into educational intervention program. Uh, this was shown to increase level of awareness and promote cessation or reduction of risky behaviors. And uh, this is um, the oral cancer risk factors, which uh, in uh, Wana Kula Sura 2009, uh, he's um, uh, put this up as the risk factor that are into three uh, parts. One is the established risk factor. One, it is the emerging risk factor. The other one is the debatable risk factor. So let's look at the established risk factor. So the established risk factor is alcohol, tobacco, and bitter quit. So this is the area that I will be talking about in a, uh, in a while uh, because bitter quit here is a definition which uh, has bitter leaf, but it contains arecana. Here it is actually tobacco. So I'll stress more about it, but you can see that the alcohol, I think most people know about it. Uh, there are commercially prepared and there are also the locally prepared, like the rice wine in um, Sabah, Sarawak. Then there is smoking cigarette. And then these are the bitter quid with bitter leaf. And in Taiwan, it's called Lao Hua, which is actually young arecana nut with bitter leaf wrapped uh, around it. And uh, concurrent consumption of tobacco and alcohol account for 70% of oral cancer cases. And elimination of bitter quit chewing translate to reduction of cancer incidence by 23 to 54%. I know that uh, in Malaysia, because uh, bitter quit chewing is actually um, in pockets, uh, it's not like smoking that is everywhere. So I think the policy on smoking uh, is a lot more uh, uh, enforced or uh, enhanced, whilst um, on bitter quit chewing, we may need to do on a targeted basis. So uh, it may be that we we'll go, we have to target certain areas in order to tackle the bitter quit uh, situation. So here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to stress, and I hope you will. Um, be clear after this. There's a dilemma in terminologies of risk factor. So the most important, the uh, two important things that I would like you all to remember is arecana and tobacco. And in this case, we are not talking about smoked tobacco, we're talking about smokeless tobacco. 
But before that, I must bring you to the history. Historically, a lot of papers talk about betel nut. It's a well-used terminology to mean arecan nut. However, it is a misnomer because betel refers to betel leaf, while nuts refers to arecan nut. So betel nut is not arecan nut. Although we still accept its usage uh, well in publication and all that, but uh, we, we would like that people understand that we are betel nut uh, is supposed to be arecan nut, but it is not the correct name for it because um, it is a combination of name of bitter leaf and arecan nut. Okay? Smokeless tobacco is an established terminology in a, which is um, consumed in a non-smoked form of tobacco. And tobacco has been long established as carcinogenic, and this is documented in um, IARC monograph. I can't remember the number, uh, but if you go to the WHO site, you will be able to uh, get these publications. So uh, the original or established definition of quit. So in 1999, we realized that uh, there is this misnomer and we thought that we'll, we'll put things in the right perspective. So we had a little workshop uh, bringing people from 11 countries uh, in Kuala Lumpur and we have a definition. And then in 2004, the IARC has another workshop and the definition remains, uh, which we're now talking about the quid. Okay. And the quid is a substance or mixture of substances that is placed and retained in the mouth and often swallowed. Apart from arecan nut, it may contain a variety of ingredients, including bitter leaf and tobacco. So what we're trying to say is the quid, they must contain arecan nut. And arecan nut is the carcinogen. Okay? So just now was tobacco, now it's arecan nut. When you add bitter leaf to it, whether tobacco is added to this or not, that is actually called bitter leaf. You, uh, they could also add slick lime, cloves, etc. But these are not known to be carcinogenic. But in combination, they are called bitter quid. So this is said. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that this quid is just bitter leaf containing arecana and some other ingredients. Uh, but there is another type, which is arecana, with or without tobacco, which has all these uh, ingredients. And at that time, uh, or at least in 1999, we called it arica quid, because the quid is the mixture of substance. And if there is no beetle, bitter leaf, it should be arica. But right now, it's fine if you want to call it just arecana. All right, because it's the arecan nut that is carcinogenic. So when or whatever studies you do, or whenever you try to talk to, to talk um, to give some educational um, intervention to patients, you can talk about arecan nut. You can explain about arecan nut. Okay, so uh, now we go to smokeless tobacco. Smokeless tobacco is consumed without burning the product and can be used orally or nasally. Smokeless tobacco products are placed in the mouth, cheek or lip or sucked, dipped or chewed. So if you notice, uh, these are just pictures that uh, we, I got from the internet, but it just shows the variety of smokeless tobacco. And uh, they are called in different names. So that's why when you talk to patients, they may just say, oh, I, um, I'm taking good car or, you know, uh, and different in, uh, in different countries, they may have different names. Okay? So there are many terminologies of smokeless tobacco and arcanat. I don't have the pictures of arcanat here, but there are also terminologies of arcanat. And some here may be a mixture of, the, um, in this picture, maybe smokeless tobacco and arcanat. And many terminologies has been identified and documented. And uh, this can be used as reference material to check for contents. What I mean is, if you want to know what's the content, whether it is Arecanat or whether it is tobacco, uh, the IARC monograph 
uh, has tabulated or given definitions of the content of all this. So uh, I would uh, suggest that anybody who's trying to work on this area, especially the researchers, to actually go to the monograph and look at the contents and then you can then categorize them into either uh, arecana or uh, smokeless tobacco. So uh, here, why I say it is a dilemma is because uh, up till now, of when in 1999, when we felt that there's something wrong because uh, so many are using betel nut, some are using arecca nut, some are using betel quid. Uh, so we sort of sorted that out. We thought we sorted that out and come up with a definition. And But now, as we look into the literature, trying to um, equate uh, a few things though we will uh, we try to say let's look at the effect of smokeless tobacco on the oral health then let's look at the effect of arecana on oral health but when we tried to do that it was very difficult to categorize them because as you see here that for example this paper actually says smokeless tobacco but they actually also uh, puts into this category betel nut with oral tobacco, pan with oral tobacco. So these are arecana, nut, right? Similarly, another uh, review, Association of Smokeless Tobacco, a systematic global review and meta-analysis. It's supposed to be smokeless tobacco, but look, it's got pan tobacco with arecana. So again, if you're trying to see the effect of smokeless tobacco, you're actually not sure now if you combine all these things. The, the third paper is also the same, and this is, has got pen or bitter leaf. And this is also supposed to be smokeless tobacco. So this is the difficulty that we're facing when we actually try to split them into either smokeless tobacco or arecana. So... Uh, and okay, why it become to this is that there's non-standardized interpretation of risk factors. For example, um, we see a packaged um, a packaged risk factor which may contain tobacco or arecana. So people will interpret in their own way, but mostly it will interpret as everything is smokeless tobacco. I think it's the misinterpretation that smokeless tobacco means everything that you chew, everything that's in the mouth, all right? Uh, but, uh, and therefore, difficulties in obtaining comparable data when trying to do uh, on risk factor intervention. Therefore, the suggestion for the way forward, which is really dependent on the requirement, if, if, actually you require to see the effect of arecana only or smokeless tobacco only, then uh, anything that has arecana and other substances with or without tobacco will be arecana. Although um, most would suggest that when you do arecana, you have to put categorize them into arecana with tobacco or without tobacco, unless the data is so small. Uh, therefore, you may have to combine. However, it doesn't mean we throw away our terminologies. The terminologies is still there. The bitter quick terminologies is still as correct as before, uh, as earlier defined. Uh, therefore, the suggestion to use it in this way is only if you require, dependent on requirement. However, uh, a lot of studies in Taiwan say um, they mainly is betel quid, so they would still use betel quid. But the issue here is the understanding of the content and the understanding of the terminology. Therefore, uh, we need to look into ingredients of the products and categorize it into smokeless tobacco or arecana or combination. And as I said earlier, there are relevant WHO monographs that can assist in the categorizing of products into SLT or arecana. So um, since I've started talking about risk factors, I'll just quickly go through this, which is not part of um, what I'm doing today, but uh, just to reinforce or refresh your memory, the emerging risk factors are actually human papilloma virus, diet, nutrition, and socioeconomic factors, while the debatable risk factors, which there is insufficient evidence, 
uh, to associate it with our cancer is the nicotine replacement therapy and alcohol containing mouthwash and a little bit more detail um, high risk hpv are usually subtype 16 and 18 uh, significant risk factor especially for oral pharyngeal cancer not so much of oral cancer and as you know the posterior part of the tongue, the base of the tongue, is actually part of our oropharynx. Uh, so it sometimes it can be um, mis uh, like is uh, that's another area where people uh, say, okay, that's oral cancer, and say, hey, there is HPV, but uh, you need to really look the true oral cancer uh, that is forward from the base of the tongue. Uh, very little HPV. Okay. Particularly among those with no risk habits, um, you get uh, you, you have HPV. A diet, I think this is a standard thing for all cancers. High intake of fruits and vegetables, reduce risk. Higher risk associated with intake of red meat and processed products. And socioeconomic status, lower socioeconomic status means increased risk and lower survival for neck cancers. And postulated to be higher prevalence of risk habits and poor diet. It's very interesting to see that uh, why is it that poorer people are having, are still smoking or uh, using smokeless tobacco or using a bit of quit when they actually have not much money, right? Because um, the these products are very cheap number one, and they really get um, very addicted to it. And therefore, and it also, there are many things, uh, there are many determinants of use for this. There are many things that uh, causes them to keep wanting it because they don't eat so much. So they're, they're laborers, they're working as farmers, and they need that this seems to stimulate them, energize them, okay? And of course, poor diet. So these all in together uh, actually um, make them more of a high risk um, that the lower income would be of high risk. Uh, the debatable risk, there's confusion whether these agents could cause cancer as it contains pure nicotine. There is no increased risk for any cancer was found among patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who are NRT. However, follow-up time was short for the moment. And alcohol containing mouthwash, inconclusive evidence that mouthwash is an independent risk factor. However, the risk increase when it occurs in association with other carcinogenic risk factors. So let's move on to the second part of uh, this lecture that I'm trying uh, to bring forward to you. And to go to this part, I will now explain a little about secondary prevention. Secondary prevention aims to identify disease at its earliest stage through measures such as screening and prompt treatment. And there are three types of screening, population-based screening, which is you go into a population and assess specifically for the purpose of detecting a specific disease, Opportunistic screening, these are patients attending a healthcare provider for another purpose are examined. For example, we encourage um, the dentists to do opportunistic screening while your patient comes in for routine uh, dental work. And targeted is conducted among high-risk individuals, those practicing established risk habits. And this for a while has been a part of the program of the oral health promotion where uh, they, they do targeted screening in Sabah, Sarawak, and uh, so that, that is another area. So I'm not going to go ahead into uh, the advantages, disadvantage, and costs and things like that, but I'm just going to move on to talking about um, why um, the strategies for secondary prevention is to actually start an early detection of oral cancer, which I think we are all practicing. Uh, professional delay in diagnosing contributes to presentation of disease at advanced stages. Uh, one of the papers actually said only 9% of dentists were comfortable in perform performing biopsies in their clinic. <coughs> so delay here could actually be 
that um, the delay in sending the patient for a biopsy. <clears throat> However, uh, the other delay is that 70% of dentists perceive that further training in oral cancer detection or screening is needed. So the dentists don't feel comfortable. They would like more training uh, because they, they may miss a lesion that um, would require urgent, um, urgent attention. Okay? Therefore, the importance of competency training in detection and management of oral cancers and oral potential malignant disorders. So uh, moving on, I would like to just uh, introduce again oral mucosolutions. I'm not trying to teach you about oral mucosolutions. I'm just talking about clinical interpretation. We haven't got any biopsy. We have got no test. We have got nothing except we are looking at the mucosa. So the oral mucosolutions are basically changes from normal mucosa. It can be becoming a red mucosa. It can be becoming a white mucosa. It can be a, a red and white areas. It can be ulcerated or it can be swellings or some other uh, colored, for example, uh, black pigmentation. Oral mucosolutions, there's so many multitudes of oral mucosolutions and yet prevalence is very low. Uh, so there's difficulties in distinguishing is number one. And whatever that you have, um, people have learned, uh, it needs to be refreshed because uh, the retention power is very low if you, have, you don't see very many of these. Okay? So that is why the importance of having uh, training in detection and management of oral cancer. And uh, so when there is... Um, non-standardized interpretation, uh, then uh, you, can, you cannot tell differences between non-malignant, non-malignant, and oral potential malignant disorders. And especially distinguishing between malignant and oral potential malignant disorder from non-malignant uh, is so important because especially the malignant would have to be referred right away for further treatment. So this is just to give you an idea I've got lots and lots of, I've uh, got two, four, six, seven, seven lesions here. Uh, I mean, seven pictures here. And they are white, they are red, they are mixed, just white and red. Uh, probably a swelling here uh, and um, an uh, exophytic or swelling there and another swelling here. Uh, so these are things that uh, you need to know. Are they, are they, Malignant? Are they not? Do you refer? Do you not? So this is very, very important. And that will be dealt with under any training um, methods. Okay. So uh, I would like to now touch on what's the state of knowledge on early detection of oral cancer among students and dentists. Um, I didn't have time to read too many papers, but I, uh, I would like to highlight these two papers where um, in a pre-tested survey, the reported knowledge of these dentists regarding oral cancer suggests that they're not as knowledgeable as they could be about cancer prevention and early detection, and that uh, the dentists actually recognize these deficiencies. Uh, another questionnaire is a self-administered questionnaire for students, and the fourth and fifth grade students had insufficient knowledge in main concepts on oral cancer risk factors. So knowledge and skills on, oral, uh, on early detection of oral cancer, I'm sure has been tackled in different ways, in different schools, in different countries. Uh, but at least I know that in my, uh, in my university and previously when I was in UM, maybe uh, the, they have changed now, but previously um, the conventional way is to embed early detection of oral cancer into the dental curriculum, but it is embedded within an oral pathology and oral medicine course. Or some schools may have started doing specialized method of teaching to gain the knowledge and skills in early detection of oral cancer training. And this specialized method may give a better, a better uh, outcome. Uh, we're not sure until it's tested. 
And the, some other schools may have also done small group student center group learning or organized specialized training workshop as an addition to the dental curriculum. So uh, let's move on. So I was so keen to know what are the competency statements in uh, different countries, either in the dental council or in the association or dental education policy. So um, I had a, 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 I sent emails to people that I know from different countries, and and I from Australia actually is from the website. I'm not even sure whether this is the most updated, but there's really no specific mention on oral cancer and OPMD, but everything is placed under overall understanding the determinants of health, risk factors, behaviors that influence health and diagnose. I think, I think that the um, early detection of oral cancer competency would probably fall under this. However, what I don't know is that they may have appendices list of things that they may have mentioned that. In Malaysia, uh, there's also a general mention under skills of distinguishing signs and symptoms of oral facial diseases. And I think we have a minimum um, competency uh, that uh, also comes under a group of oral lesions under oral medicine. And in Vietnam, this is uh, my colleague in Vietnam did not send me this Vietnam dental professional competencies for newly graduated doctor. However, she extract and inform me that generally there's a mention under common oral and maxillofacial diseases with no specific mention or cancer. And therefore, all the schools will put it into their curriculum uh, to do that. And then in Cambodia, from competency, uh, this, I think uh, Dr. Caleb had sent me this prakas, prakas which means, I think, uh, some uh, policy or something, uh, legal paper, on core competency frameworks for dentists in Kingdom of Cambodia. And as I looked through, I could see that there are areas that talks about disorders of jaws and oral facial soft tissue uh, with a mention of pre-malignancy and oral cancer. Then in USA, generally, there's general standards for competency, no specific mention, and this is from the accreditation standards for dental education program, Commission on Dental Education. So again, I'm saying that I'm just flipping through, there may be other areas here, and this, um, I think I got this from um, Professor Ross Kerr. Uh, I need to do more work to know more of this, but it's really of interest to me. Uh, Professor Nagao from Japan uh, sent me this model core curriculum for dental education in Japan, uh, 2016. And it's actually basically, they develop more, a model core for the curriculum, but there's no specific mention of oral cancer and OPMD, but uh, it is to be developed in the university curriculum. And in Taiwan, um, got, I've got this information um, from Professor Yang Yixin and Prof Wang. Uh, mostly embedded in the curriculum as a general topic under oral medicine, and it is really all in the dental school curriculum. So that's as much as that I have obtained. Therefore, in summary, guidelines of competencies are generally not specific to oral cancer and OPMD, except for the specific mention of oral cancer in Cambodia and Vietnam under appendices. Uh, again, I remain to be corrected because these are just a very quick um, quick overview that I've obtained from uh, friends and colleagues. Using these guidelines, most schools have either embedded or are expected to embed the knowledge and skills training into the university's curriculum. And now we move on to the actual training. Training of since everybody is supposed to be doing it in their curriculum, let's look at uh, what are effective training or teaching methods on detection and diagnosis of oral cancer or OPMD? Uh, there is a, one paper from UK that they use clinical photographs with explanation of each photo uh, of the photograph after each slide. Then they give it's a short one, 10 cases, discussion after every case. And they actually get a median sensitivity. I, I think the paper is a little bit more complex than this, but I have just extracted mean sensitivity of 77 to 81% and specificity of 69 to 72%. 
in primary care dentists and dental hygienists in differentiating between cancer, OPMD, and benign lesions. I, I see this method could be quite good in a sense that it's got up to um, even 80, 81% of sensitivity. The other method, which I feel that that's what the, my school have been using in the past, is extensive didactic lectures and theoretical tutorials with limited practical or clinical components. Students reached an optimum, optimal diagnosis in more than half of the cases. However, most of the students failed to provide the minimum expected standard for describing reported lesions. And, and I'm going to uh, just mention two more. I'll go first to the questionnaires and clinical images. There's a study that um, uses questionnaires and uses clinical images. And it actually shows that the sensitivity of visual diagnosis of cancerous lesion was 61.4% and OPMD of 59.5%. And lastly, it is uh, a training method that um, we've developed at Oral Cancer Research and Coordinating Center. And it's being uh, used in Malaysia, uh, especially by a Ministry of Health. Uh, it's called Oral Detect, and it is a spaced, repetitive test enhanced corrective feedback, where uh, the outcome is overall percentage of diagnostic accuracy uh, for both dental professionals and students increased to above 80%. And uh, that just very quickly, this is a training program for early detection. Our goal is to recognize oral mucosal solutions and differentiate between potentially malignant and non potentially malignant with a minimum accuracy of 75%. We feel that if they reach 75%, they're good to go, but most of them actually reach 80 to even 100%. How do we do it? Consecutive series of pre assessment, training set of four lectures two to three post-assessment with discussions between both assessment sets. So the, but we always have a pre-calibration to know what level they are, series of lecture, series of post-calibration, and after each post-calibration, there is a discussion. And this discussion is what's most important. After every calibration discussion, and then we test them again, um, the accuracy goes up, all right? And uh, this is just something uh, of interest from that publication. Uh, I just wanted to show you that um, we, uh, we had done, uh, I mean, this have been going on in MASA, uh, two years of students UM and one year of UKM. Interestingly, the starting point is the lowest is MASA, the middle is UM and the highest is UKM. It's actually at about 80%. So uh, they're already good to go, but they still they still do this. And uh, of course, in between, during the learning session, there may be some dips depending on the lesions, but most are on the increase. And by the post-test three, everybody reach 80 to 95%, 85 to 90%. So we actually reach our above 75%. But I would like to explain a little about this. Um, these students, the MASA students, when we gave it to them, they're in year five, but they have OOP and OM finishes in year three, done in year three, finishes in year three, and year four and year five, I think there's uh, not much of uh, reinforcement, I mean, in our old curriculum. No, now we're adding more. And I think that is why their, their retention of what they learned is not there. And I think UM also is similar, uh, but I've actually asked Dr. Nolly, um, and she actually said that they have it in year three or pathology, oral medicine year four, and you have oral medicine year five where they go to clinics. And because they have the UKM hospital, they do see a lot of real time cases. So that is why I think they are quite good. So I think you can see that, of course, uh, real cases is still the best. But when you don't have real cases, you could still use images. But you need to do something structured and they need to be assessed and you need to see them improving, meaning that if they're not doing very well, we actually uh, use that, um, we actually uh, discuss with them 
And so I would say that most of the method where there is small group teaching with discussion, with feedback, uh, seems to uh, lead to a better outcome, right? And uh, the other difficulty is the different lesions have different difficulty level. And when you start, the most difficult is leukoplakia because it's white. Is it malignant? Is it OPMD or is it just a traumatic lesion? So these are things that need to be taught and need to be corrected. The second one is um, suspicious of cancer. If, if it is early lesion, it is also very difficult because it can be either leukoplakia or uh, cancer. But if, if it is very advanced lesion, everybody is able to say that. Or a submucous fibrosis, um, here, why it is so high is it's very difficult to use images with oral submucous fibrosis. So we have a system that we have questions and answer. The, as soon as they ask whether there is limited mouth opening and fibrous bending because they can't feel, um, it's correct, right? And then, of course, erythroplakia is also difficult. Um, and, uh, I mean, because you don't see it that much, but finally, the lack of plainness, which a lot of people see. So sensitivity, specificity, pro pro predictive value, positive and negative, all increase over the course of the program to reach about 90% for the participant in the group. So in conclusion, uh, if we talk about understanding risk factor terminologies, correctly classifying as a smokeless tobacco, aricanat, bitter quit, towards accuracy in the evaluation of impact of risk factors on oral health, correct identifying risk factor for development of oral health promotion strategies, again, towards oral cancer control. And the next conclusion is on competency requirements of dental graduates. Uh, based on what I presented uh, earlier, uh, therefore, it is of importance that schools, uh, if they have not done so, uh, that we suggest that to re-evaluate outcomes of types of training or teaching methods embedded in the curriculum. And uh, if it, is, uh, it shows that the, um, the method do not produce such a good outcome, to re-look into possibilities of a more structured competency training or uh, teaching and learning on early detection for cancer. And of course, uh, as I said, the I think uh, oral, oral mucosal lesions, which means that also trying to evaluate or distinguish from OPMD and cancer, uh, would be best to be, uh, to be reinforced every year, meaning that uh, if you start in year three, it should be reinforced in year four, it should be reinforced in year five. And this reinforcement can be through um, group teaching, through um, case-based learning, through case-based discussion, and of course, uh, self-directed by the student, meaning let the student do all this, then they will learn a lot more. They can uh, create the case, they can um, look at the case, and they can, then they can actually discuss the case. And... Um, you can be a facilitator. I, I personally feel that this is the way to go to get competency requirement, to get competency of the dental undergraduates. Similarly, before I end, I would like to say that uh, oh, for dentists also, uh, it would be uh, interesting for them, I think, if we were to do a case base where they are is directed by them, where we just give the case, but they, they actually learn about it. And um, once they know about it, I think it remains. The different types of learning actually also uh, determines whether you have retention of them. I mean, understanding means retaining the facts. But if you just uh, do a very didactic lecture and, you, and the students think they have to memorize, it's difficult. It cannot uh, maintain or retain the knowledge. So I think with that, I would like to thank um, Dr. Wan Maran Nabila and OCRCC who helped me um, uh, a lot in part of this lecture and Mr. Wong Gorian, who's my staff now, who was in OCRCC for part of the lecture. And the, my international colleagues for the contribution on the country's guidelines on competency of early detection of oral cancer and OPMD. So thank you very much. And um, I will, I'm happy to take questions.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rosna, uh, for the presentation, and uh, it has bring some a uh, few highlights that, that we actually I, I like to ask, but before I ask something, there is uh, two questions in our Q&A uh, question. It's from Professor Calum, eh, from Calum. Uh, he asks about uh, in different publication and databases, oral cancer is said to be the fourth common or fifth common or sixth most common type of cancer in Southeast Asia. Why is it their difference? Seem to be lack of consensus? Yeah, I, I think uh, we need to see the publication. Uh, as I said earlier, the other areas of confusion is oral pharynx and oral cancer. Uh, because strictly oral cancer is um, the uh, in front of the base of the tongue. Anything from the base of the tongue backward is oropharynx. So sometimes people are not very particular about that and they group them together. So uh, when they're grouped together, the, um, the incidence is a lot higher. Yeah. So it's a matter of how they uh, classify or group them. That's the right. That's right. That's why, I mean... Uh, sometimes people say, why are you being so particular, Sonia? But it does matter, isn't it? Because to the policy maker, it also matters whether it's, it's um, 4 or it's 16. <laughs> yeah. So the other question also from uh, Professor Callum. Uh, what do you think of the future of possibilities of teledentistry for detection of OPMDs and OC in private practice setting and in community settings? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I will, I'm for teledentistry, but I think teledentistry more as an adjunct to assist dentists. Okay, uh, so uh, the with teledentistry, the, uh, the thing that we mean we need to be careful about is the the uh, confidentiality. Okay. Um, so if you need to do teledentistry, it has to be properly done uh, where all the confidential is taken care of. I know that already a lot of people are doing teledentistry because people are selling, are sending, sending pictures and all that for consultation. But I think um, the way to go is to develop teledentistry further by having a proper and safe uh, channel that... Uh, say a dentist or even non-dentist who feels that they, uh, in their own mouth they see something or in their family's mouth they see something, they would like to send to a dentist. Uh, but it's not for the final diagnosis, but it actually says that whether you have to worry or not, whether you must come quickly or not. So teledentistry play a role in early detection of oral cancer. Uh, the, the only thing about teledentistry is about patient confidentiality. That's like. right, that's right. Yeah. Okay, another question, uh, this one by Anonymous, he said, in the era of uh, digital world and internet, would it be useful to have a database and re-pictures, sorry, re-pictures of lesions so that everyone can access easily to help in diagnosis? Yes, uh, that is definitely useful. And I think... Um, Prof. Uh, Dr. Saman Wanakula Surya started in Europe, okay? And they have a database of all the images. However, uh, I think somebody has to maintain it. I think for the last he told me when I was asking for a few of these things was that it seemed to, um, it has not moved on or something like that. I, he has to correct me. Uh, but he did say something like that. And so he, actually he's very interested if, we are doing for our area uh, and he would like to come in. But what I have proposed, which nobody is, uh, which I couldn't get a grant, is that uh, we develop a case based um, where you actually have a case and then you have a history and then you put four, uh, like a question, a few questions, and each question will have like four answers or three answers. And with uh, and that helps in uh, using uh, training using the um, digital training where 
when somebody clicks on one answer and if it is wrong, the, the, they'll pop up the answer that says this is wrong because. And then they can click to another one and then it will say this is correct because. You know, and this would be very useful if we can have a lot of that. So, uh, through there is a, a group of us that started by Cancer Research Malaysia, which is called EpochNet. So, we all are very keen to do this. And, in fact, well, we actually applied Toyota Grant to do this, but we were not successful uh, because um, it's very difficult because you need maintenance of the website. And again, you talk about confidentiality, but it would have been great to have a lot of cases from throughout Southeast Asia or Asia uh, put up. And then dentists are able to go and self-train themselves. I mean, they can all go through our training first, but after that, because every time they feel there is a problem that they can go to say, okay, I'm, I need to look at white lesions. So they can go to a, a, a place that says white lesions and they can try and look at different things. And I think that would be most helpful. But coming up with the, the, um, the website, I mean, the actual safe website, and of course, uh, coming up with the questions and the cases, it's a challenge. But I think once we have money to do the website, I think I already have a group of people under EpochNet who are willing to do this. Okay, so definitely, yes, there is a way to go. Okay, thank you for the very long explanation about answering the, the questions. Now, I also see uh, two questions from the chat. Maybe, uh, Dato, how you want to ask personally our speaker other than I think? Okay. Hang on, I switch off. I leave. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor um, Rosna, for such a very uh, informative and impressive presentation. All right. Uh, and I very specially impressed with all the data that you have shown uh, in different countries in their curriculum, as well as the epidemiology and the prevalence of the oral cancer. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. It's truly a very impressive lecture. Now, I have a few questions which related to the clinical uh, observation. All right. The first question is that, is there any correlation of chronic periodontitis that cause a malignant change in free cancerous oral lesions, whether it's a white lesions or the red Lesion. Yeah, this question is asked is because I see many uh, precancerous lesions in the presence of extremely poor oral hygiene. All right, some of them is periodontitis that cause this problem. I'm not sure whether this is a direct or indirect uh, or contributing factor. Can Prof enlighten us on this? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, of course, at one stage, I didn't think oral hygiene has any bearing, but now there are more and more. Um, uh, studies that shows that oral hygiene may be may have a bearing or with, not directly but um, with some other, other responses. responses. Yeah. So, so I, I think it would be very important to get our patients uh, to, to to educate our patients as well. Yeah, on that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I actually leads me to a second question. Yeah. Uh, as we understand that uh, the dental students in our dental schools are being taught about how to diagnose the uh, or, oral lesions, uh, that is actually very good for the early detection. And then uh, when they become a dentist, especially when they go to the private practice, will you encourage them to expand their role to not only early detection, but to actually assume certain roles of management, right? And if that's the case, what will be their function as a GDP? Okay, okay. Um, I think that mm -hmm. uh, first is early detection. Mm -hmm. And uh, after you detect an early lesion, the first management is um, uh, reduction of risky behavior. So that's a management that they, they must at that level. Mm -hmm. However, um, 
if they, they must be good at diagnosing the, that disease, potentially cancer, potentially, because clinically you won't know. So you can you always have to say potential, potentially this, potentially that, yeah. And uh, the, the thing that they can do is they can be good if they are good at uh, doing an incisional biopsy if it is only a small flat lesion. However, if they suspect it is cancer, it is not advisable to do in a clinical practice where you're not able to quickly send for uh, actual management. So that is my advice. I think to me, uh, most dentists must be very well versed and know very well. Uh, even if let's say you don't, you I don't care. Is it lucoplica? I don't care about the name. But the most important is you know that this is malignant. You know that these features are potentially malignant. That's most important. That is why some people do their training. They don't do training by lucoplica. I know they do their training by benign malignant, um, potentially malignant, and they said, do uh, they then teach them, do you need to refer this? Or uh, what? Uh, do you need to treat this first or something like that? So there are many ways, but uh, that is still trying to get the dentist to be uh, well-trained, okay, in management. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, so now we know that the GP should actually learn on more on the advisory role as well as some simple management, I also know when to refer. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now, so now this is a clinical observation. The third question is that uh, we often notice and observe that in the presence of chronic occlusive trauma, for example, a sharp cast or a constant mm -hmm. biting on the cheek and tongue, right? Some of them actually turn into unhealed chronic ulceration which eventually also turn into malignancy. All right, so another question is the chicken and egg situation. Is it because of the chronic trauma that lead to this SCC malignant changes? Or is it because there's already a presence of that and this is just a, a triggering factor? Can Prof enlighten? Um, I believe that there's already mm -hmm. um, a factor that will trigger that. Mm -hmm. And the um, um, chronic irritation may be just additional, all right? Uh, but when we talk about this is where we say you really need to know differences because there, when, say, a tooth is biting on the cheek and you get a lesion that looks like inverted margins and things like that, of course, you will say that is cancer clinically. However, there are chronic ulcer, a special chronic ulcer that looks or mimics the cancer. But when we do an incisional biopsy, it is what we call non-specific chronic ulcer or eosinophilic granuloma. There is some, uh, there, uh, no, sorry, eosinophilic traumatic um, ulcerative granuloma, not the eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, and this uh, is due to some uh, process uh, of, uh, uh, healing and things like that. And once we uh, do an incisional biopsy, uh, the thing heals. So it's most important uh, not to jump in and say that's cancer, uh, especially when there is a trauma, like a repeated trauma. Uh, you need to do an incisional biopsy. But of course, I like when we teach them, we will teach, okay, if there is induration, then you probably think that is cancer, but still incisional biopsy. But if you really think it's cancer and you do not have the expertise or the uh, treatment, further treatment, you should be referred to the surgeons. All right. Okay, please allow me to ask one last question. I know our sure, vice sure. president, Professor Asha Mali, put out a hand. Huh? Okay, now, um, in a clinical situation, I have also seen some... Uh, previous history of treated oral cancer, but patients has actually go into remission on that, but then presented after many years with some nodular, okay, hardened, right? Uh, which looks a little bit like submucosal fibrosis, all right? Yeah, and then upon visiting the ENT, 
ENT told them to do another um, biopsy. And the biopsy seems to be very radical. And the patient is extremely worried about that. Okay, so Prof, would you advise them to see an oral maxillofacial surgeon to do that? Or what do you think about this? Um, I think, yeah, I think there's no harm in getting a second opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's my advice. If the patient is um, sort of unhappy, I mean, whatever it is, it is, uh, it is still possible um, that that is a cancer. But if the the patient um, feels that would like a second opinion, they can go a second opinion to uh, the oral max fat surgeon. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. Okay, I shall mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, request our vice president, Professor Asha Malik. Okay, okay, sorry, then. Professor. Yeah, okay, right. Mm. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, uh, it's an excellent presentation. I'm maxillofacial surgeon in Thank Pakistan you. and uh, 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 working on a cancer surgery since 20 years, reconstruction and all the things. And uh, uh, I'm uh, astonished that you have not got the data or you have not uh, contacted us regarding curriculum of our universities because we are at the top of uh, in oral cancer in throughout the world. Yeah. And our uh, uh, research paper published every year are maximum as compared to that of any university in uh, the world. So we have established uh, our parameters for detecting the oral cancer because uh, I can say that uh, in every week we have two or three uh, oral cancer at uh, stage two or stage three level we are going to operate. Really, actually, we have uh, done one study that is stolen in blue and that we have given to general practitioners. And we have given them uh, uh, just a, a training program just for a few weeks, just to detect the tolerant blue effect and refer the patient to us, especially with reference to the uh, leukoplakia, erythropoeia, and especially to uh, late stages of uh, submucous fibrosis. That actually helps you a lot as compared to that of photography, because there is color differentiation in the photos. There is a different cameras, there is light interpretation is different. And sometimes the pixel do not give you an accurate identity of the lesion. So we do, don't believe too much on photography. We believe on the tolerant in blue because it gives you very good interpretation of dysplasia. And uh, it gives you, especially in uh, uh, hyperkeratosis and orthokeratosis, it gives you a very good picture whether, whether there is any uh, changes in the uh, epithelial network. So uh, have you ever tried in your teaching schedule uh, to learn in blue? This is my first uh, question. Yes. Um, I've not tried that much, uh, but I've got colleagues who have tried but all the papers point towards uh, use of tolidin blue may be number one, expensive. Number two, it is still best in the hands of a surgeon more than a general dentist uh, to actually uh, tell perhaps where are your margins, there are how far you're gonna uh, cut. I mean, there, a lot of paper is on that. Uh, I mean, it's a good, it's a good diet, yes. Uh, we, we have used actually a uh, well scope, all right? And uh, that also does show a uh, good result, but it's expensive, it's difficult uh, to, to do. And so to, to say that we are gonna get all uh, many dentists to do, many people who are in the, uh, in the villages to do is very difficult. So even though there may be limitations with pixels and all that, uh, I know that our Cancer Research Malaysia has come up with what they call Mimosa. And there is a certain level of, um, of resolution that they would ask in a phone to actually take the picture. So uh, we, we do the best we can because we are now talking about not the full-blown cancer because that one's quite easy. We're talking about the borderline. Yeah, so, but uh, yes, I think it would be nice uh, that you have done so much work um, and, you know, uh, would be good to share with us, yeah. Uh, lady, uh, our, in our university, we have the curriculum and we are taught, um, 
teaching oral cancer in very much detail. And especially our final year BDS students, they are very well aware of detecting the uh, oral cancer and especially third year students who are who used to talk the oral uh, medicine, they are very much aware of the detecting the oral cancer, especially for the margin, especially for the bed, especially for the lymphadenopathy. And yes, especially yes. I will, uh, what the Datu how was excellently uh, uh, said one question. And that is the answer is that uh, sir actually what uh, if the ulcer well, that is traumatic ulcer it is a, a, a long standing and more than 14 days it do not heals then we are going to have the incisional biopsy and a lady very well uh, answered it that uh, there is uh, always the potential of the malignancy beneath it. Uh, if there is already a potential and there is uh, further more chronic trauma is going on there, this ulcer is going to convert itself into malignancy. But if the potential underneath the tongue or the mucosa is not there, this um, uh, chronic ulcer may be fibrosed, may be keratinized, may be thick, but it may not be a malignant. That is the right answer that uh, we have to uh, assess that underneath uh, uh, already changes are there. The patient is under alcohol, patient is taking gutka, patient is taking betel nut or other things. That means that the potential is also going on there. And if there is a super added, a sharp cuss or uh, overhanging filling or uh, 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 ortho clasp is there and this is going to have the potential addition in it and it is going to be converted into squamous cell carcinoma. Lady, it was an excellent presentation and yes. in Pakistan, we are the only country in Pakistan, we have the four cancer hospital that is only yeah. related Thank to you. cancer. That Thank is you for sharing right. with us, yeah. So and anything you, you regard uh, regarding to oral cancer or like that, you can contact us and we are yes. going to give you uh, all We'll the definitely contact you if I do any more on the curriculum as I was, uh, I was very keen on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ashraf Malik. I'll get you connected to Professor Rosna. I will share both your email together. So okay. That you thank you. More information. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I, I just want to ask one last question. I think there is no more question from the chat box or from the Q&A. Uh, from your experience, from Rostam, uh, do you think that in the Malaysian context, especially with the, our competency statement, competency clinical skills are affected, do we give enough time uh, or SLT in our terms uh, for oral medicine and oral uh, pathology uh, sessions? Um, I think the SLT is enough, but it is the method of teaching. Because I know that uh, having to having taught or pathology or medicine from long ago, the method is just lecture and then um, the show picture and all that, things like that. But I think the method of teaching has to change now. It has to be student-centered. Student-centered will also mean that you, you can give them a picture, you give them, uh, you give them uh, the need and you say, you do it, you ask the question, you answer the question, and then we discuss. And when they have to do that, they will also have to actually research on things. And then that's where the learning comes. So to me, uh, in Malaysia, uh, we have enough uh, of SLT, but spread it and reinforcement, meaning that it has to be, if you can spread it and re and even if you finish year three, there need to be reinforcement in year four, there need to be reinforcement in year five. And unlike what um, Prof. Uh, Dr. Asha has, where there is so many cases in Malaysia, there's no, not many cases. Therefore, uh, we only have pictures to deal with. But if we have this discussion or student-centered learning is still the best uh, within the SLT that we've given. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Maybe now, Prof. Shah Malik, since um, uh, this uh, learning is beyond borders with uh, internet, all these things, classes, maybe uh, when you have some interesting cases, uh, uh, Prof. Ashraf Malik in Pakistan, you can share with us. We can broadcast to our all students in Malaysia to see, because as Prof. Rosna said, 
Um, so, we might. Uh, 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 sure, and that too. How? That too, Ibrahim. Sure, I will. Uh, it it is my pleasure that uh, uh, I will share, inshallah. That uh, um, uh, actually, uh, I am also doing the program on the uh, television as well. And last Sunday, my uh, television program was the oral cancer and it prevention. It was for the public. Uh, it was uh, interpreted in my uh, mother language, Urdu. And uh, it is uh, actually uh, given uh, to hold the public of Pakistan on the television. It was the uh, uh, national uh, network uh, television. And uh, inshallah, we have very learned maxillofacial surgeon in Pakistan. And a few, they have the international fame as well. And few of them, they are the writers of the maxillofacial books as well. And inshallah, whatever you will uh, ask me, uh, we are going to share all our cases and our, our uh, results uh, with you, inshallah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rosna, for mm -hmm. sharing um, your experience with us uh, tonight. And also, it was a very interesting session tonight. We have a discussion among our panel members. So mm -hmm. this is uh, this is what we hope to get in our uh, future uh, uh, sessions. And uh, uh, what we know. And uh, again, on behalf of uh, ICD Section 15, uh, we would like to thank you, uh, you for sharing your experience with us. And we hope that uh, our audience tonight uh, will benefit from the lecture. And also maybe uh, we can follow up for the about cooperative yes, learning about school yes. uh, perhaps under international college of dentists you can start doing because there's so many countries you can also start doing um inter-country work in that area yeah okay we will look further into that okay thank you very much so now i think um, as usual I, <coughs> I will introduce uh, our next speaker um uh next session the speaker all right uh the speaker is um, um is is uh, Dr. Nagam Abdullah. Okay, she she will talk about uh, hidden cost of uh, hidden cost of three D imaging uh, printing pictures. Uh, so the, what uh, she is going to share is uh, from what I got from her is that um, about how CBCTs uh, uh, can help uh, in making some diagnosis. So. Uh, that's basically what she got to say, but the topic, uh, she put it in a very interesting way uh, to catch our uh, interest of our viewers, inshallah, uh, on the 23rd of February in two weeks' time. So till then, uh, we meet in on the 23rd of uh, February uh, for our next um, uh, webinar on the hidden cost of 3D imaging a pretty picture. Okay, I can again on behalf of um, uh, IC Section 15, myself, um, the organizing committee part, uh, uh, Dr. Mayuna and Dr. Amy Amelia. Uh, thank you very much um, to all of you uh, who has joined us tonight and uh, see you all again in uh, two weeks' time, uh, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. And for the Chinese year, see you still on the New Year mood. Uh, so happy Chinese New Year. And uh, see you then all in in two weeks time. Thank you and uh, good night. Good night. Thank you.